Hello, it is Tuesday, December 25th. It is the last week of the year. You are watching news from Kazakhstan on K+. An apartment complex caught fire on Saturday night in Bektau village, 80 kilometers from Astana. Eight families were left without shelter. Firefighters arrived when the building burned to the ground. Our correspondents report from Akmala region. The loud blast woke the residents at night of December 23rd. It was later revealed to be an exploded gas cylinder. 38-year-old Marina Rasulova lived in this house for five years. On Saturday night, she and her daughter stayed alive miraculously. The woman talks about the details of fire barely holding tears. She looked out into the entryway and saw that explosion ruined the wall in the apartment next door. She told me to grab the documents because there was no hope to save the building. So we went out and haven't walked back in there. My daughter went back there to get some things. We've managed to save the TV set and the DVD player. Immediately after the incident, the victims of fire have been temporarily accommodated in the dormitory of the local orphanage. The district authorities issued clothing and food and organized fundraising right away. The local administration allocated funds to three large families to stay in rented houses until spring. The rest were only promised a one-time grant of $400 by the officials. We are currently resolving this issue looking for a legitimate ways to purchase new housing. By law, we shall compensate the fire victims the amount equal to 40 MCIs. It's official, while there are no funds to buy the housing for them. Manshuk Kuangan, a mother of five children, moved here from Mongolia a few years ago. She hardly bought an apartment and now lost it overnight. She appreciates the government's aid but realizes that the housing issue will be raised in spring. My husband and I are both unemployed and we cannot afford buying a new housing. My husband works seasonal jobs. I get $40 welfare benefit for five children. I'm grateful to local authorities and the fellow villagers. However, I still have to ask for help from rich people who are not indifferent and the imams from Astana. We welcome any help and my kids will always remember that. The villagers say that the fire trucks arrived only two and a half hours after the call and should they arrive 30 minutes sooner, they could at least save half of the building. Firefighters themselves refused to comment. The authorities assured that it took the firefighting crew a while to go to the 18-kilometer distance from the district center because of the snowstorm. In Atarao, several ground floor apartments collapsed into the basement in one of the apartment complexes. Residents were evacuated, though many of them left their apartments two days ago when first signs of breakdown appeared. Rescuers are currently on duty at the site while the building is turning into ruins before one's very eyes. The authorities, however, refuse to classify it as critical to this day. We investigate in the next story. This multi-story building is empty for already several days. Last weekend, tenants had to leave their apartments as the building can collapse any minute. Some went to their relatives, whereas others had to spend the night on the street. Officials, as well as representatives of the emergency department, tried to calm tenants down, but all their attempts failed. Are you ready to take responsibility if this wall collapses? We have small children here. Do you even care for people's lives? Even the mayor of Atara reacted to the news and personally arrived at the scene to meet with the tenants. He promised to resolve the issue as soon as possible. Experts from the State Architecture and Construction Supervision confirmed mayor's words. They seem to be ready for the inspection of the building, but not until the basement is drained. The foundation is visually deformed. Unfortunately, the premise is now flooded with fires. Once it is drained, we will try to handle the situation. On Monday, it was reported that the floors had collapsed in some of the flats, prompting the evacuation of about 90 families to a nearby school. People are afraid that they will have to stay in the school for a long time and ask for a special commission to make a decision regarding them shortly. Interest holders of the Jaili 2 and 3 residential complex in Almaty demand to remove the city administration top brass. Residents met with officials, prosecutors and financial police investigators inside the school children's palace on Monday trying to find out where are the keys to their apartments and whether construction company's main friend Amangildi Irmegiyaev will see charges brought against him. Our reporters maintain the housing issue was ruined by the ownership class. The gap between state officials and ordinary people seems to get narrower as the city officials, prosecutor's office and financial police announced about initiating a criminal case against the construction company director Yuri Sterikov who is wanted. As for Amangildi Yermigiaev, the honored constructor of the state and the head of the holding company, the representatives of the mayor's office declined to comment, but people spoke out instead of him. 
Amangildi Yermigayev tried to launder the money of the stakeholders and get away. He simply wanted to deceive us. In response, the financial police investigator refrained from commenting on the case, perhaps rushing to find a guilty party. Turn it off. Can we interview you? No, no. According to estimations of state officials, to complete two construction projects worth $66.4 million, they need a half of the sum. No investor is on the horizon, therefore, Manas Sirgazi, the head of the capital construction company of Almaty City Administration, proposes to stakeholders a very simple plan. The suffered real estate investors can go to the court to transfer asset ownership rights to the housing association, which will consolidate these assets and transfer them to us. From that point, the capital construction companies take on the projects. However, the real estate investors of Jaili project do not believe in this scheme. The state authorities are simply not trustworthy and unaccountable. Nothing has been reached within two years of investigation, which involved meetings with officials, protests and even chasing of Amangildi Yermigyev in the government halls. Meanwhile, people remain without their apartments. Head of Kazakhstan's Media Alliance Law and Justice, Tokbergen Abiv, went missing in Astana. He left his house in the direction of his office last Thursday and was not heard of ever since. Colleagues and relatives appeal to law enforcement officials whose main lead is kidnapping related to professional activity. Abiv was to hold a press conference on corruption in Astana City Administration. We must draw attention to his disappearance and search for him as soon as possible. Perhaps those who detained him will let him go home. It's the full state search for journalist Tokbergen Abiv, the editor of the Law and Justice website and the head of the same-named Kazakhstan's Media Alliance, dissipated last Thursday. He went out at evening and told his wife that he headed to the office to get the work files. Tokbergen's eldest son didn't see his father near the office that day. You were supposed to meet him, but you were late. Did another car pick him up? It seems that way. Abiv has an interesting background since he was convicted in 2008 for bribing the financial police officer. According to the verdict, Abiv was illegally collecting classified information against judicial bodies. However, the journalist didn't admit his guilt at that time and after the release, he resumed his work. According to his colleagues, Abiv's works were on anti-corruption topics and often involved the names of Astana state officials. I believe it is related to his work. No other theories come to mind since in the morning he announced about a sensational press conference, but already in the evening he's gone missing. Meanwhile, Astana opposition activists acquainted with journalists turned to law enforcement bodies and they assumed that Abif was bugged by secret services. If their assumptions are true, then the wiretap recordings could help to find him. We are simply requesting them to provide the tapes which have captured the discussions with a person who invited him for a meeting on December 20th. If they have them, they should act immediately, otherwise they might be late. The preliminary investigation is underway, but if he doesn't come home by December 26, then the police will initiate a missing person case. In other news, trial over Respublika newspaper continues in Almaty. An entire Monday was spent on detailed clarification. The judge ran out of time and was unable to pass her verdict, postponing it until today. More on the final days of the trial in this report. Is it possible for 41 publications to be considered a single media entity? Judge Gulmira Bisenova didn't manage to find the right answer on Monday, despite her clear desire to complete the trial as quickly as possible. She, however, found time to dismiss two petitions filed by defense. The lawyers requested to use Skype to question witnesses Evgenia Majitova, the editor of the Russian website Respublika, and Yulia Kozlova, the editor of the newspaper Moy Dom Respublika. We need to make sure that the witness is identified before he is allowed to testify. Agree. Do you have any more motions? The motion came from the prosecutor who, for some reason, asked for the case to include newspapers that are already involved in the trial. The judge, though, granted the petition and went on to hearing the arguments. There was, however, nothing particularly new in the prosecutor's speech. Virtually all materials used by the newspaper staff have reference to carry on traditions of publications such as Respublika, Business Survey and others. Each of these outlets refer to readers to the same internet resources. The appropriate evidence has been attached to the case. 
Among other things, the proof of extremism charges apparently comes from the uniform editorial policy as well as joint staff and legal address of listed media entities. The defense team, represented by attorney Yelena Savinova, objected to prosecutors' arguments. They publish articles about medical services provided to the population. The publication is strictly medical in nature. It contains constructive criticism of medical institutions, which in no way can be interpreted as promotion of social hatred or calls to overthrow the government. Lawyer Tamara Simakina failed to find any extremist content in Moedom Respublika, but the judge still repeatedly rejected requests for expert examination of the papers, as well as questioning the alleged experts who labeled the publications extremist in the first place. If we follow the logic of the Almaty prosecutor, the name of this article also raises concerns, as it's called the Prince for Condoms, but it's about the use of condoms as part of promotion in the time for Prince William's wedding. In the end of the day, lawyer Sergei Utkin said that everyone already knows what the trial outcome will be, hence his team is not working for the sake of the current process in Almaty, but for the later presentation in the UN court. Judge Gulmira Bisenova is expected to deliver the verdict shortly. The trial concludes over three Almaty residents charged with theft in the amount of half a million U.S. dollars from the St. Vedensk Church in Karaganda. The court sentenced the group leader to six years imprisonment and two accomplices to five each. The accused stole money and dozens of jewelry from the church in August. However, during the seizure, police and church servants were short of half the stolen sum. The accused and their attorneys attempted to prove it is the law enforcement officers that pocketed the money. Our reporters attempted to find out who is telling the truth. The robbery of Karaganda Svetovidinsky Church was planned and organized by Alexander Zaychikov, who previously served in this church. Hence, he knew where everything was stored. In August of 2012, along with accomplices Anton Alimsky and Alexander Yezhov, they stole almost $600,000 and dozens of church valuables from the safe. The robbers were arrested six hours later and showed the stash. However, according to the defendants, the police didn't seize the plunder for some reason. They have drawn up a protocol later along with the witnesses and members of the church. However, the church didn't retrieve the full amount. They showed the place where they stashed the money to the police, but when they went back there, they found a lot less money at the bottom of the bag, yet nobody touched the religious items. The defendants couldn't dispose of the stolen money, therefore it could only be the policemen. There were only $332,000 left in the stash bag instead of $600,000. The valuables were in place. The defendants themselves claim to have spent only $13,000 and have no idea where did the rest $272,000 go. Nevertheless, on Monday, the court sentenced the main burglar of the church to six years of imprisonment with confiscation of property and his accomplices to five years. Parents of convicted are convinced that this punishment is a bit too severe and therefore ask the Lord and the court to forgive them, but to no avail. These are the people of the church. What happened to the mercy? It seems the Pope is more concerned with money rather than the human soul, even though he is an archpriest. The church representatives requested the court to have the defendants compensate $272,000. However, the judge denied the motion. The final call has to be made by financial police who initiated a criminal case against the investigative team in charge of the church robbery case. They intend to investigate whether this indeed was a double robbery, while the parents of convicted plan to appeal the decision of the court. Due to a land scandal surrounding the Almaty Cemetery, members of the Muslim Union of Kazakhstan propose creating a blacklist of corrupt officials. First to be included are the names of those to whom nothing is sacred anymore. At least that is where our correspondent is reporting. The territory of the old Muslim cemetery was fenced off about one and a half years ago. At that time, Bostan Dik district administration set up this massive stone structure. However, a tin fence recently was installed here, although no one seems to know whom it belongs to. Soon after, a sign saying property for sale appeared here. Four acres of land cemetery could turn into a private property at any time. As a result, the Union of Muslims drew public attention to this issue. I dialed this phone number and asked them about issues that could be related to the cemetery. They told me everything could be solved and no issues will arise. When I asked them about the price for the property, they replied that price can be negotiated during the meeting. Zhumagas Kesikova was outraged by the same advertisement. Her family has been visiting the grave of her mother here almost for 50 years.
Only bones are left there, if there are some. It was a shock to us. We have grandchildren and grandchildren who will ask us what is going on in Kazakhstan, what the government is doing to prevent this. Aren't there enough land? However, a lack of land is apparent, especially in this neighborhood. In the beginning, the city administration cited the Asian Olympic Games as a reason. Since the cemetery was allegedly located near the ski ramp, it will be used for good cause. Later, the mayor promised to build a park and garden here, but everything remained on the paper. There was a rumor that some rich person bought this land and built a hotel and restaurant. It is not just an ordinary rumor, since I've asked the cab drivers who parked there and who told me about the hotel and restaurant. Head of Muslims' Union can't call the story around cemetery other than vandalism. Murat Tilebekov believes, similar to notorious Magnitsky list, they should develop the Muslim list, which will include the most corrupted officials. According to him, those who are involved in this case must be punished by blocked bank accounts, property confiscation and denied entrance to developed Western states. These are senior officials, state figures, MPs, even senior officers of NSC. And I'm not talking about other officials that fled the country. The Muslims list must also include the officials who are probably responsible for trading the land of the cemetery. The Kesika family intends to turn to court to keep the remains of their mother in peace. Membership of Kazakhstan's entrepreneurs in the National Economic Chamber at Tamikian may become mandatory early next year, and not without a price. After all, maintaining the chamber leadership's reputation along with its expensive staff costs money. The business world provided differing comments on the executive authority's directive. More on the subject next. All businessmen are called to join Natamikin and avoid boycotts following the president's message, where he defined a framework for entrepreneurs' operation. It is advisable to introduce the principle of mandatory membership of local businessmen in the new National Chamber of Entrepreneurship, which will serve as reliable and competent partner of the government. Small businesses representative Natalia Pupchinka supports the idea of unification. The owner of the dry cleaner believes that the union is indispensable for local entrepreneurs. I don't attend their meetings, yet I am informed about them, and I do believe it is necessary. We should be members of some association, preferably if it is one unified organization in Kazakhstan. In the meantime, other businessmen are against the move. A membership of such kind would force them to pay certain fees to Atamikian. We already have certain burdens. Local manufacturers still haven't fully recovered after the crisis, so it's going to be difficult. According to the Atamekian Union, the initiative seeks to involve entrepreneurs in legislation development. Currently, only the government is in charge of the process. Membership fees shall be sufficient to ensure that these associations could afford hiring certain experts who would work on the legislation, summing up all the data in terms of market analysis of different products, marketing, etc. In other words, it requires certain financial, human and intellectual resources, etc. According to some experts, not all entrepreneurs would be able to deal with the extra load. This new union very well could finish off those who barely survived the crisis. All entrepreneurs are in different situations. Someone make enough profit, others have unprofitable or unstable business. Not all can afford it, and for others it could be an excessive burden. Businessmen are now concerned about the tough political fate of Atamikin. After all, there were already two attempts to turn the union into a serious party, so perhaps the third time's the charm. Chairman of Akjola Azad Pirwashev made several proposals at the final meeting of the Customs Department. First, it must concentrate on drug and weapon trafficking across the border. Second, it must stop imprisoning for economic contraband or importing goods with procedural violations. The head of the Entrepreneurs' Party is convinced Customs office employees profit from intimidating business people with jail time. According to our data, only 2-5% to of criminal cases initiated over this matter make it to the court. The rest of criminal cases simply fall apart. Why? Because the person committing the crime is subjected to extortion and then simply released. In other words, the person pays his way out of it, while the actual implementation of criminal liability for smuggling is only a source of corruption. Chief of Customs Majid Yisimbayev agreed with MP on this issue. Perhaps the entrepreneurs will soon be receiving large fines instead of prison terms. Besides, the drug trafficking indeed requires more attention. There were large quantities of opium and heroin seized at the border. This is unheard of, said Yisimbayev. In fact, in 2013, the drug trafficking situation at the Kazakh border may grow worse due to the fact that NATO withdraws its troops from Afghanistan in 2014. The chair of Customs Control Committee has an overall sense of accomplishment at the end of the year. According to Yisimbayev, he's the 
department accomplished all tasks or even more. Yet the final effort to complete the annual plan and budget revenue, which amounted to over seven and a half billion dollars. We're currently at a 98% level. We expect to exceed the plan for at least 1.5%. We're talking about $99 million. You're saying that the budget will gain more than $99 million revenue in a week? It's not quite a week. These are the issues which were addressed over time, while the one-week revenue is something that's related to legislation. These types of issues may now fall under the Customs Union Commission's jurisdiction in the new year. Experts say that is where all the roads are leading to. On Monday, another event served as proof of a strengthening Russian-Kazakh friendship. The metro station named after the city of Almaty opened in Moscow, despite heated debates and local residents' complaints that the station was suddenly renamed after its construction from its initial title, Bratyeva. Residents of this microdistrict attempted to right the wrong all year, but in the end, friendship prevailed. Russian-Kazakh friendship, that is. The next and final story is on how the new station was presented and what arguments were used to convince Muscovites that a Kazakh name is not only fitting, but even patriotic. The opening ceremony of the new subway station in Moscow suburbs was rather unusual and nearly took everybody back in time to World War II with all the military artifacts and field kitchen and bonfires. Only city officials as well as Russian and Kazakhstan flags bring back present reality and clear the situation. I think that we accomplished a great deal this year having unclogged dozens of underground stations that used to suffer severe congestion. Seems fine so far, but then the mayor moved on the station's name. We chose the name of... So why this choice? Just six months ago, residents of Bratieva district, where the Almaty station is located, protested against this name by collecting signatures and organizing pickets. The law on self-governance is violated as there were no meetings to rename the station. The authorities brought a completely unrelated examples of the Almaty street and the streets named after Panfilov war heroes, supposedly relevant and important for Kazakhstan. But then we learned that Panfilov city in Kazakhstan itself was renamed back in 1992. In the end, local residents' players were ignored and the name of the station was eventually linked to Panfilov's Guard Rifle Division. Congratulating local residents, representative of Kazakhstan said the name was chosen to commemorate the heroes. Back in 1941, Panfilov Division was formed from residents of Almaty. They fought to death protecting our motherland and our common capital. And this beautiful station was named Almaty to pay tribute to these heroes. Even Panfilov's daughter was invited to the opening ceremony. She doesn't mind the name, even though it doesn't explicitly mention her father in any form. This is a very important event. Despite the collapse of the Soviet Union, the countries have always maintained friendly relations. It's a long awaited day for almost 100,000 residents of Bratieva. However, neither cheerful songs and buckwheat porridge with canned meat at subway entrance could change their opinion. Of course we are happy, but we would be even happy if the station was called Bratieva like the district. All residents of Bratieva wanted the station to be named Bratievska, that is just the voice of the people crying in the desert. We've been waiting for this for so long. Concerning the name of the station, it is difficult to say whether it was the right decision or not. After all, Almaty is a city in Kazakhstan. Why nobody asked local residents' opinion about renaming the station which was previously decided to be given the name of Rativa? That is all we have time for today. Have a productive week.